help me Good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord. It is good to be with you all on this, uh, I'm going to say Sunday evening, on this uh, Wednesday evening um, for Bible study. Greetings to those who are joining us via Facebook Live. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to make sure that I can get on Facebook Live so I can try to follow the comments that people are sharing. Um, all right. Yes. Um, <clears throat> So greetings to those who are joining us online. Um, let us open up in a word of prayer. Hop right on in, in tonight's study. God, for this evening and for this day, we give you praise and thanks. Uh, we thank you for the provision of health and strength that you've given us um, for food and clothing and shelter and our most basic needs being met uh, on this evening. Lord God, we thank you for our family and our friends. Uh, we thank you for living um, in comfort, the comforts that we do have, roofs over our head, beds in our homes, the fact that we even have the technology to be present with each other uh, while also being in our own individual homes and um, living rooms and kitchens and bedrooms, oh Lord. Uh, Lord God, we pray that you would be with us during this time that your spirit would minister to us, that you would give us the words of life that we need, the encouragement that we need um, to be all you've called us to be in such a time as this. Uh, so be with us and watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, so tonight's Bible study is actually going to be connected to tomorrow, um, May 5th, which will be the National Day of Prayer, Cinco de Mayo of all days. Um, and during this time, I, I don't know the, the full history of it. Um, I, if I had time earlier today, I would have looked it up. But uh, I think that this has been around at least for a couple of decades. And um, churches, basically communities, um, ecumenical communities will gather all around the country uh, and dedicate themselves to prayer, uh, praying for their local communities, their churches, obviously praying for our nation uh, and praying for the peoples of the world. Uh, and so this year they did choose um, a scripture from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 uh, as the focus and as the theme uh, for, for this year. So for Bible study tonight, we're going to be looking more closely at that, uh, at that section of, of Colossians, uh, but also sort of in general talking some about prayer. Um, let me... So let's get some discussion started. Good to see you, um, Minister Alexander online. Uh, this is Frederica. So if God knows everything, now we do believe God is omniscient, right? God knows all. Why do we need to pray about anything? Are we really making God aware of something God don't already know? Talk to me, saints. Why are we praying if God knows everything? Hmm. Don't all go at once. Why are we praying if God knows everything? Is our praying bringing God's awareness to something that God is not already aware of? Oh, y'all quiet in the house tonight? Oh, y'all can't unmute. I just saw that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Um, now let me see how I get to that option. There we go. Uh, there you go. Now you can talk back. <laughs> All right. All right. You got me locked up. There you go. <laughs> locked up. I said these folks is mighty quiet tonight. I said I know it's a little provo provocative question, but Lord, you have been locked up. I'm talking inside. Oh, I said they real quiet. You can hear the mouses walking on the walking on the rafters. I 
I'm trying to give you sign language and you can't even see me on the camera. I can't. Are y'all driven. cameras turned off too? Well, they were, but I'm glad. Yes. Yeah, they still turn off. Oh, y'all got all the restrictions. <laughs> we pray because God asks us to do so. Uh huh. He, he knows everything. But he wanted to. Uh, he wanted to know if we are also committed, like he is. And I think it's about our relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Because when we're praying, we are talking to God, and we are in relationship with Him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got some some. Uh, engagement online as well. Prayer helps us to focus on God, uh, Sister Tanya Wimsley uh, Porti says, and uh, Dr. Hawkins says to acknowledge God and to thank God for what God is, what He's already done and will do. Um, God wants to hear from us. God wants to connect with our spirit. Uh, so God knows we know. Uh, so so God knows that we know He knows everything. Um, the prayers for us, Reverend Nick. Mm. So that gets at that second question. What do you think prayer is really about? If God knows everything. It's when we confess our sins. Mm-hmm. God is faithful. To forgive us of our sins. Mm-hmm. You know, and it also us- gives our opportunity to ask for help. Mm-hmm. And also to keep the communication going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so some of how we think about prayer is prayer is really an opportunity, or at least in some part, an opportunity for us to come to grips with our own limitations. God that. knows everything, but we don't know everything. No. Nope. And so even though we can sort of articulate that God knows everything, sometimes there's things that things don't come to mind until we actually start to try to articulate it. You know, this is one of the things in, in and Reverend Wallace could probably speak to this, but in talk therapy, sometimes people don't actually have an understanding of their experience until they actually talk it out. And then they become aware of what the nature of that experience was. They become aware of what was it about that thing that made them feel the way that they felt. Um, And so in some regards, prayer is an opportunity for us to, on one side, recognize our limitations, even about what we know, but also recognize the limitations that point to what we need, right? This is where prayer becomes confessional. And our confessions are not just confessions of sin, but they're also confessions of gratitude. We also have confessions of needs. We have confessions of you know, our heart's desires. Um, and all of those things, as we're doing those things, those confessions build what? Relationship. Build relationship. And what qualities of relationship? A sincere. Sincerity. What was that? Communication. A relationship between a father and son or dependency. uh, Mm -hmm. So a familial relationship, dependency, sincerity, it builds intimacy. And it answers the question, if I may, Reverend Nick, it answers the question as to what God said he came for. He came for the sick. He didn't come for the well. And the point is, we who call out to God, we call out to God because we need God. As you say, we are at a point of limited capabilities and and, and probability. For that matter, we need a Savior. And so in our prayer, we cry out to our Savior, and God wants to hear our cry. Because he gets the glory when we cry out to him. He doesn't want us to be well. He said, I didn't come there for the well. I come for the sick. So, and I cry out to God through our prayer. 
Right. There's there's a I think that that's a good a good metaphor using the notion of of crying. Um, when a baby cries, a baby cries oftentimes because it may have a particular need, but its cry does not. Um, in the way that we understand the, the 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 usage of language, its cry does not come with a language, right? The parent understands or comes to understand what different cries indicate those different needs are, but the parent also knows what the baby needs and hopefully can supply the baby with what it needs. So the parent knows that this cry is a, a child who's hungry, that this cry is a child who's tired, that this cry is a child that need that's wet or soiled and needs to be changed, that this cry, you know, is a child who just wants attention. Um, and so while the child may not be able to differentiate and say, I'm hungry or say, you know, change me or, you know, do those things and they're crying out the, the knowledge and the wisdom of the, the parent is able to address what it is that the child needs. And, and so sometimes even in our prayers, we may be thinking we are saying what we need, but because God is able to recognize better than we can what we need. Um, even, even as the scripture says, even our moans and our groans are interceded by the Holy Spirit, right? Making confession for us. And in addition, you, you, you say cry, and it's so important, I, I, that line of communication to God. I asked the gentleman today about his baby, his new baby, and he's the father. And I asked him, I said, well, well, how's your new baby? And he said, well, she cries a whole lot. I said, but that's her way of communicating with you. He said, no, it's just that she makes too much of noise. Now, I don't want a father like that. <laughs> that's not the father we have. Well, but sometimes I that's true. That sometimes it is true that for, for God's own, and it doesn't mean that God will abandon us, but sometimes we just make a lot of noise. But and hey, God has to... But God learns, God has already determined in God's self that God is not going to abandon us. No, and so even if God is frustrated, even if God is disappointed, even if God is like, ooh, mm, 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 God repents, like he says, why did I do this? God's mercies. And somebody ought to be glad because you know you be whining. Why can't I have? Why won't I get? Why won't you give me? Right? No, you be whining. But God's tender mercies are new not once a decade, not once a lifetime, not just on your birthday, right? Your special day of the year, not just on Christmas and Valentine's, but those tender mercies are new every single day. That was almost like saying God's nerves are renewed every morning and we dance on them. You know, we be, I, I, I would say for me, I'd be dancing on them. And God reminds me as my kids be working my little nerves, God be like, how do you think I feel? In, in addition to that, I don't mean to bog out the conversation, but it's so, you, you said it so clear. God knows all that we could ever want or need because he's designed it and he's predestined it. But in his, in his divine wisdom, he, he wants us to have enough sense to make the right choice, to let it be known that he is our God, that we trust him and then depend on him as our God. Yes, that's one of the things that Sister Frederica said in the, in the the um, on Facebook was that you know trust is a part of uh, what prayer is about. So, why and how does a prayer life matter? Woo! Because God. Before Sinister. Reverend Bobby gives all the answers as a <laughs> Reverend Bobby, anybody else before Reverend Bobby, how does a prayer life matter? Reverend Bobby going to be the, uh, he, he the Reverend. <laughs> he, he didn't study. How does a prayer life matter? And why? Oh, y'all quiet again. They quiet on us, Reverend Bobby. They quiet now. Hmm. It matters because when you make your request to God, the most humblest way is through prayer. It matters because that's where our strength is gained. It matters because it strengthens our faith and our walk in Christ, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Amen. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hawkins says it keeps us focused. Mm -hmm. It brings us closer to God, too. Brings us closer to God. Mm -hmm. 
and shows him that we want we want to communicate with him on a consistent level. Mm-hmm. Communicate on a consistent level. That goes with what Sister Frederica said on uh, Facebook. If you never talk to someone, how are you going to build a relationship with them? What? God wants a relationship with us just mm-hmm. like we want a relationship with our kids or our wife. And we are around our wives and family every day. And we talk to our wives and our families every day. And God wants that same kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing to, to piggyback on that, Brother Richard, there's some, even in some of our most intimate relationships, we don't really communicate with people. We can live in the same house with folks and they don't know nothing about what's going on with us. No. <laughs> That's true. Because you do I... have to be intentional about sort of sharing some of those things that are in your mind. I know constantly in, in my own personal life, I have to work it sort of like, because I can have conversations in my head, and this has been a, a place of tension. Uh, especially early on in my marriage uh, with Nikisha, is that I, in my mind, I had a conversation. I thought mm-hmm. about it, and I knew what you were going to say, and I responded in my head to what you were going to say. And when mm-hmm. I told you, I was like, well, we talked about this, because you was going to say it. And she was like, we did not talk about that. That was all in your head. Thank you, and, Reverend Nick. I thought I was crazy. Go ahead. Look, and, so, and so with that, right, so some of what what we cultivate in the prayer life and in the openness of our communication is we cultivate the actual practice of pulling what we sense or what we think is on the inside and bringing that to a place where we can engage in relationship. Mm-hmm. That and that's trust. the intentionality of it, right? Right. That's the right. That's the trust of it. That's the intimacy of it. That's the, you know, um, and, 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 and the beauty in relationships is that sometimes it's not even that you have to be the person who initiates that. It sometimes comes with the thing that somebody recognizes, maybe what's going on with you? Mm. you're real quiet everything okay uh, you know you're not a, you're not your talkative self today is everything all right what happened at work somebody get you up at work <laughs> right so even as we think about our relationship with god and part of what makes god so different is that even though we sort of mentally know god is present god is everywhere because we don't see god like we see our boss and our co-workers, and the people who live in our house, it is easy, 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 easy for God to sort of become a, um, I call on God when I really get in a mess. But in terms of my habit of, of cultivating openness and intimacy with God on God's terms, that's sort of where we can understand how a prayer life gets to be a little bit tricky. If I'm only talking to God when I feel myself in a crunch and in an emergency, right? Yeah. Um, that's what it, if anybody's been a parent to, you know, uh, that, that teenage to young adult where once they get out your house, the only time you hear from them is when they need something. Mom, you got $20. Uh, <laughs> Mom, my car not working. Can I go get your car? You know, Dad, I really need you to help me uh, co-sign. And also, Reverend Nick, God wants a relationship with us, period. Just like he said, Enoch walked with God. And then he went on to say that God had a relationship with Adam. He just don't want us to call him when we in need or when, when things is going bad. He wants a true relationship with us, just like father and son or, or mother and daughter. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. Mm-hmm. It's not yes. just so we, is bad. Yes. So we, in some regards in the church, we, we do have to recognize that what can constitute as prayer should probably be a lot wider than what we've typically accepted as prayer, right? We typically think about prayer as a formal activity, mm. right? And we even have prayer, like formal prayer language, you know, um, to sort of, and we, and on one side of it, the ceremonial nature of that language, you know, we, we use that ceremonial nature to make the language of that, uh, to make it more solemn, right? To give it weight and to give it health. The good example of this is the prayers that we lift during the communion liturgy. You who do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for your misdoings, come to the altar, meekly kneeling, making your confession known. That's not how we normally talk. And then when we offer the prayer of, of, 
uh, of general confession, that's normally we beseech and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which free from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed. That's a, a, a form of ceremonial speech that elevates our concern about it. And when we have prayer just as elevated ceremonial speech, we run into the problem that Jesus was talking about with the tax collector, right? Or with the uh, Pharisee who prayed, who had all the robes on and had all of the ceremonial guard, but what was missing? The heart. The heart. Yeah. Now, what is so vital, I think, Reverend Nick, is that we must be guided in the way that God has left for us to be guided. God, as the provider, sent us a savior and the savior left us with the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is what prayer regenerates. The prayer helps to re reinvigorate the spirit that God has left with us. And when we pray, we pray to the Holy Spirit to strengthen us so that our relationship becomes more in, in, empowered by our practice of constant prayer and meditation so that we can develop the gifts and develop the fruits from the gifts of the spirit. We must stay focused on our Holy Spirit because we have let it been, we, 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 you ask, where's Jesus? Jesus has told us he is right at the right hand of the Father. He sits in heaven. But he said, I won't leave you alone. I'll leave you with a comforter. And this comforter is the Holy Spirit. And when we pray and meditate and read scripture, it helps to infiltrate and empower us to have that relationship as disciples in Christ. So it's paramount and it's vital that we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Prayer strengthens our faith and trust in God. That's what Sister Tanya just said on, uh, on the Facebook. So in thinking about prayer, if prayer is a conversation with God, what are some of the first recorded prayers in the Bible? If prayer is a conversation with God, what are some of the... Now, what is a conversation? Let's get that out the way. What's a conversation? Communication between two, two people or more. Any interaction mm -hmm. uh, between two people or more. Okay. So what might we identify some of the first recorded prayers in the Bible? Reverend Nick, that's a good question. Uh, I was reading, I was reading uh, in, a, in a book, uh, it was called Adam and Eve. And uh, the first prayer was Adam. I, I, I think it had to be with Adam because Adam was so remorseful for what he did, him and Eve both, and they were so hurt and so distraught that sometimes they couldn't even get up. They were so depressed and they were hurt. And all we have to do is just stop for a minute and imagine how bad that man felt and how bad Eve felt because uh, that, that scene that they did in the garden, it changes everything. And I think the first recorded prayer had to be Adam and Eve. Right, so if we, if we hold that Adam and Eve, when God speaks to them, God tells them, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. This is in Genesis 1 and then subsequently Genesis 2. We don't get a response to them saying, yes, God, we will follow and we will obey. No. We don't get, a re we don't, we don't get that. But after they have eaten from the tree and they realize their eyes are open and they realize that they are naked and they get those Amen. fig leaves. Amen. The voice of God moves throughout the garden and what does God do? God asks a what? A question. Right. Where, are what is, where, where are you and what? Why are you why are you hiding? 
<laughs> so if we hold that the first sort of prayer as a recorded conversation is a question where God asks, why are you hiding? Now we know because God knows all things that they could not hide from God, but from their perspective, what were they trying to do? Cover up they were trying to hide. They were trying to cover themselves. And so the first invitation to prayer is an invitation that is really about the question of why are you trying to hide from me? It, it, it makes me think of that, that particular story. When we dare to go naked before God, we have nothing to hide. Yeah. But sin makes us think that we got what? That we can have. Uh -huh. and, right, and that's the thing, is right. It makes you this is the double whammy of sin. On one hand, sin convinces you that you need to hide. And then on the other hand, it actually makes you think that you can hide. Right. <laughs> like if you don't tell him the truth, he won't know the truth. Now we Amen. see this, we see this. Now we, you know, we we oftentimes put such deep um intention behind the effect of sinning, but we see this even with children. A child will come into your face, chocolate cookies smeared all over their mouth. <laughs> Hands greasy, buttered up, chocolated up. And you ask them, did you eat? New ask because you know the answer. You know, it's not that you don't know. Did you eat one of them cookies? Nope. And that child will get what cookie? Crumbs on their face. What cookie? And that's the thing. That's the thing that we kind of miss out on when we're dealing with children. We forget that they are little souls that were brought into the world full of sin, and they have no control. And we're trying to teach them, and we don't have full control. Well, and that's the point. I mean, that's that's the that is the point. Is that if we think control. See, these are all the ways that we learn how to use things that are fig leaves. We think that control will hide us effectively. We think that discipline will hide us effectively. If I just get this discipline thing right, then, you know, then somehow when God raises the question, why are you hiding? I'll be able to say honestly, you know, or effectively that I'm not hiding. And so what what I love, if we think about prayer as a conversation, if we think about prayer as a conversation, what we see in Genesis is that prayer is really an invitation to stop hiding. Now, on Amen. one hand, that's liberating, but on the other hand, that's also terrifying because as we become aware of those things that are sinful, our natural proclivity is to hide them. Amen. Because we don't want the shame right, that sin brings upon us. And that's from the top of the, top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs. Right? And then there's another notable prayer recorded, first prayer to Reverend Nick, the prayer with Abraham prayed for the people of... So right, so Abraham's destroyed. prayer, which comes right later in Genesis, is when his son Lot, or his nephew rather, Lot, is in Sodom, and because Lot is in Sodom, he prays that God not destroy the yes. entire city. Yes. And then we know about Lot's wife, who looks back uh, and turns into a, a, a pillar of salt. That gets at this second question here, uh, an example of prayer that is a petition, an example of prayer that is an intercession. And so at that point, Abram recognizes a potential of fate that may belie someone else, and he asks God to relent. He asks God to not. Um, and we see this kind of prayer multiple times throughout the scripture, right? We'll see this come up again when Moses is like, you know, God, I didn't make these people. Mm -hmm. These are your people. You call them your children. They are not the children of Moses. Mm -hmm. And if you right. destroy them, then the people are going to say, are you really the God? Right. What kind of God are you? That yeah, you, you brought them destroy out your chosen them. people. Yeah. Um, you know, and so prayer as conversation, prayer as petitioning. Um, you know, we won't go into all of the things, but the things that Jesus says about prayer, um, you know, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. Yes. Um, and he teaches disciples to pray by ordering them around the fundamental sort of ordering of the Lord's prayer is a recognition that God is our. God. Father. Yes. Right. And so yes. in that in Jesus opening, Jesus sort of 
um, doing away with a notion of like there is some in between, right? There is some some entity in between your relationship with God and or some some entity in between that has to mediate your relationship with God. No, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, mm -hmm. reverenced is your name, mm -hmm. sacred is your name, right? Um, your will be done where we are as your will is done where you reign, mm -hmm. right? So the prayer that Jesus teaches, what Jesus is teaching about prayer is the prayer is this means by which God is able to infiltrate, right, the earth to bring about what it is that God desires in, in God's own will and God's own, uh, God's own plan. Um, what is the relationship between prayer and conflict? What's the relationship between prayer and conflict? What's conflict? Confrontation. Okay. Whether positive or negative, I feel like the relationship between prayer and conflict, that prayer helps me avoid negative conflict. Prayer gives me resolutions through conflict but it's being able to express that conflict. So I may be off target. I read it, I answered it. Go for mm -hmm. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it's, I'm, I'm petitioning or asking God for something. And yet I might have some doubt that it will happen. Mm -hmm. you know, I wanna believe, but I'm not quite believing all that struggle, mm -hmm. that would be that conflict. Mm-hmm. Reverend Nick, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when we, when we, sometimes when I read the Bible, I ain't gonna say we, sometimes when I read the Bible, uh, I often imagine what Jesus is saying and what the Bible is saying. And when we read about Adam and Eve, when they sin, and then one minute they were uh, like angels. They could see the spiritual world. They could see angels and God even walked with them in the garden. And then all of a sudden the flesh came up, up, up on them. Okay. And then they couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't talk to God and they couldn't even see the angels. Can you imagine how terrified they was and how scared they was? And also that when Adam prayed, he asked Jesus, you know, to put him back in his first original form that he was in. And, and, and I think that that has something to do with the person that you just asked, because that that was scary, man, for those guys, man, because they were like angels. Then all of a sudden they look like us. And, 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 and Adam and Eve prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And, and God told them that uh, he can't do nothing for them to the, uh, well, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Let's push this. When Adam and Eve sin, what is the consequence of their sin? Oh, my Lord. Yep, they were disobedient. In the so scripture, that, what's the consequence? The consequence. What does the scripture say? Because we have a lot that we put on Adam and Eve that's not in the scripture. Amen. Adam and Eve, when they sin, they what? Their, their eyes were open. Open. And they did what? <laughs> well, ran and hid and covered themselves. Realized that they were naked. Naked. So before they sin, <laughs> y'all good Christians not gonna like this. They were living in a kind of grace of ignorance. My lord. <laughs> now, who do you know who lives in the grace of ignorance? Babies. Children. Children. <laughs> and so part of what, you know, part of how we have to read the Adam and Eve story and the way it's constructed is that part of what we get when they sin is actually sort of a coming of age, mm. right? All of us remember the age before you was probably about eight or nine years old. You'd be running around that house butterball naked. But one day <laughs> something clicks in your mind and you'd be like, uh -uh. <laughs> don't look at me. I don't want you to help bathe me no more, mama. Okay. Right. So I we 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 get the notion of like sin and the darkness and the 
the depravity and you know all of those things that 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 sort of compiles as we come along but the first the first thing that happens in their sinning is that they recognize that they were ignorant before and that they were in a vulnerable position in their ignorance mm -hmm. now after their sin they try to cover themselves and their ability to cover themselves is insufficient so what does god do god Make covers them. them right this is where god uses the animal skins to cover them and then god has the conversation <laughs> where we're going to talk about consequence and the consequence that emerges that God says to them, of course, you're going to die, right? That was that was because that's what he told them on the first. One. So you're going to now die. But not only that, but you are now going to experience labor and toil both to eat and to replenish life. My Lord. So labor and toil to get the food from the ground and labor and toil to actually make babies. Mm. And so some of what 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 is lost in the um, in the in the in, in sin is the youthful innocence, right? The 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 sort of um, ignorance of of you know my shoes being on the wrong feet, or you know those kinds of things. Now, of course, that's a few of of huge consequence, but I think what it what it also helps us to see is that part of what Jesus does for us at this point is Jesus does not return us to an Eden state. Amen. Amen. Right. So I know we love that song that says, let's go back to Eden, live on top of the world. <laughs> Jesus is actually not taking us back to an Eden, Amen. but Jesus, is, is, Jesus wants us to recognize that even when you sin, God's love will come and get you. Amen. That God loved you so much that God put God's own self in flesh, experienced the worst kind of death that you could imagine during that time period of his own, of, of Christ's existence, and death, the cost, the wage of sin, what sin produces, what sin's end game is, which is death, even that could not stop the love of God from God reconciling all things to God's self. Praise God. And so for us, our position is not just to sort of lament what sin takes, but is to rejoice that God's love has rescued us. My Lord. And so, you know, to that end, Brother Jones, what we have to, this, Jesus says this oftentimes as people are responding to what he does, particularly when the woman, not the passage that pastor preached a couple of weeks ago, when the woman poured the expensive perfume, there's another version of a story similar to that in the Gospels, where a woman comes and she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, um, wets his feet with her tears and washes his feet with her hair. And Jesus says, uh, Simon asks, do you know what kind of woman this is? And Jesus says, well, because she has been forgiven much, she gives much. You think you ain't been forgiven a lot, so that's why you give little. So she's responding based off of what she recognizes God's love has rescued her from. Amen. And so the only the extent to which we have to be conscious and conscious interest of our sin is solely for the sake of being grateful for what God saved us from. Which is why we can say things like, you don't know, like I know what the Lord has done for me. Because I know what my sin had me doing. And on some days still got me doing. But God's love, what is it? The 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 love covers a multitude of of sin. So to some extent in our in our various kinds of particularly uh, Calvinistic, pure, uh, Puritan um, uh, theologies and even evangelical theologies, we've given sin so much power really so that we can find ways to kind of make people feel guilty and therefore control them about their sin that we miss. Jesus has addressed sin once and for all. If the blood ain't covered sin, then ain't none of us safe. None of us. And that's that's the wonderful thing about the sacrifice when we think on the sacrifice and how how cruel and unjust it may have been but the glory of the sacrifice the shed blood for all our sin then we are 
perceived as righteous through the eyes of Christ because he set it up that way, that by sacrificing his son, we would be recognized as righteous. We would be seen as righteous. And because of that righteousness that we've been perceived as, we must take a transformative mindset. That's where we start to grow in our walk by developing a mind to serve and be obedient to the will of God. Excellent. That's a great segue into both the focus of the national prayer, but also the scripture that they have. Exalt the Lord who has established us. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. That's the focus, uh, the theme scripture for the National Day of Prayer on tomorrow, Thursday, May 5th. Um, so we're going to look at Colossians. Let's look at verses 6 and 7, and then we'll look at a few more verses after. Let's just read these. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So just these two verses, what are these verses encouraging? Come on, y'all, if y'all want me to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what Facebook is saying. Facebook, what are these verses encouraging? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And what was the question again? What are these verses encouraging? It's encouraging us to stay in the Lord and with the Lord. It encourages us to realize that Jesus Christ is our Savior and, is, and that if we are going to uh, be successful as Christians, then we got to stay in him and with him. We got to be rooted in him. We got to study his word. You know, we got to look to him for our source, our strength. Amen. Yes, this text affirms uh, what Pastor preached about a couple of weeks ago from John uh, 15 about the vine and abiding. Um, that there's, that if there's anything the enemy wants those of us who have expressed a confession, uh, a, a confessing faith in Christ is that the enemy does not want us to continue. In sin. Right? He wants you to throw in the towel. He wants you to give up. He wants you to walk in the opposite direction. He wants you to lose hope, lose faith, lose confidence that God will do what God said he will do. Right? So that you do not continue to live your lives in Christ Jesus. So he wants to sever, he wants to obfuscate, meaning he wants to cover over, he wants to sort of limit your ability to see what you have received in Jesus Christ so that you will not live your life in Jesus Christ. And if you're not living your life in Jesus Christ, you won't be, what does verse 7 say? You won't be what? Rooted. Rooted. You That's won't be built one. up and you won't be established in the faith. My Lord. So whatever it means to continue in the faith means has something to do about being rooted, built up, and established in the faith. And it's not a faith that fell out from the sky and you picked it off the ground and it was shiny and uh, like a like a gold coin. It's not a faith that you went to the store and you bought it. It's not a faith that you uh, uh, put together with some scraps of, 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 of old pieces of fabric and, and made into a quilt. It was a faith that you were oh. taught. I so the, realize. I'm sorry. Go ahead, but Reverend Nick. Right. So the, 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 the work that these verses are encouraging is helping us to recognize that there is something important about how holding on to what we have been taught, right, what we have received from Jesus Christ Amen. is what is necessary for us to stay rooted, grounded, and established in the faith. And Amen. as we do those things, the end of verse 7 tells us that we will abound in Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving. 
So if you're around a whole bunch of folks who claim to have the faith in Jesus Christ and they have nothing to be thankful for, then we ought to raise questions as to how are we continuing in the faith? Because if we really believe that Jesus saved us from what he saved us and that he is saving us from what we are being saved from and that he will save us from the things that will try to come us, then part of what we will have in that rooting and that being built up in our faith is thanksgiving. And in that form, go for it, brother Bobby. And in that form, we must, I must develop the desire to deny myself and be in cooperation with God through my body, with his plan through my body in this earth. I've got to have a transformation mind, transformed mind, to focus clearly on what the scripture talks about Jesus so that I can understand who Jesus is and my relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. I come to realize that I'll be guided by the Holy Spirit and I'm developing those gifts because it's so vital that we study, that we meditate, that we understand that the world and the flesh will keep us, as you say, will keep us a veil on us from the goodness of Christ. So we've got to stay in the spiritual sense of studying the word and being a mindset that only focuses on what thus says the Lord. That was the original plan. So we've got to be in the image of God by being in a relationship with the Holy Spirit by being guided by the word of God. Yes. The only push I'll have on that is that's a lot of what we have. But the scripture, even in early in Colossians, um, it says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, right? The key word there is to let it. In the same way that the key word in verse six is that it's what you have received. Yes. Right, so we may think that the work is ours. You can't transform yourself, boo. Wear yourself out. And no matter how much you do your discipline in, you can go to the gym every single day. You can be the fastest runner, the slowest runner, the biggest pitch up a person. But when God says, give me back the breath, guess what your body going to do? Give me back the breath. So mm-hmm. what we what we have to recognize is that if we are receiving, which is to say my hands have been open to receive what God is giving, I am going to let, it's the permissive, part of what we are actually doing is that we are learning to surrender and submit, Uh right? And that surrendering and submitting becomes the means by which God is able to transform us from the inside out. And it's that prayer life that gets us there because through that prayer life you submit, when your heart is filled with that spirit, you get moved out the way without even knowing it. The we, scriptures are the scriptures are not a mistake when they say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and confession is made known. And so sometimes what we have to do, and which is why prayer is an important conversation, is that sometimes we just gotta be honest about what's in our hearts. God, I really don't, I am. I am entrenched in this sin. I like doing what I'm doing. I know that it's wrong, but I don't know how to not let go of it. And that's what's in my heart. And I don't even know if I want to let go of it, but I know this is not the best that you have for me. Right? That kind of prayer is an honest prayer. Mm -hmm. Versus God, I ain't gonna never do it again. I ain't gonna never do it again. And it's a liberating prayer. It is a liberating prayer. Because you got to be where you are. You have to be where you are, and the the faith that we are called to have is the faith to believe that Jesus will find us, will meet us, will engage us, will encounter us where we are. 
But if we are trying to convince ourselves, oh, and this is what we do in the church real good, is we convince us, oh, I shouldn't be where I am. I should be so much further along. I'm a preacher. I should be so much further along. I've been in church for 30 years. I should be so much further along. I gave everything to the Lord. I stopped smoking and drinking and da 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 I should be so much further along, right? If that becomes our mindset, then we miss the opportunity that your faith is about where you are. Not where you think you should be, not where you could have been if you had da 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 da. Amen. And Reverend Nick, where you are, in it, where you are, and if you know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you would be content. Not only yeah. that, Brother Richard, when God does what God does, we don't see it. It's for my sisters and brothers to see it. I shouldn't be sisters trying to check will and see it. it. The other piece is that yeah. you ain't going to let go of some stuff until the Holy Spirit gives you, yeah. <laughs> it does the gr grace work for you to let it go. And that's hard, right? That's hard to accept. Amen. It's like Amen. there are some things that you just can't let go of until the Spirit frees you from that, which is why Amen. we do pray prayers of deliverance. Lord, deliver me. Leandra said, deliver me from me. One thing is solid. In the bottom a line, a tree true. can only produce figs. Amen. Each tree can only produce peaches. And the bottom line is that we're not going to live forever. And if if when we make it in, it's going to be by God's grace. We're That's not going to live forever. And when we make it in, wherever I'm at on that totem pole, I'm going to be thankful and grateful as heck. Look, I know I, how I got over. My soul looked back and wonder how I got over. It wasn't nothing but the grace of God. So if we no. if we holding that, what the relationship is between the believer and Christ Jesus in this is My that Lord. Christ is what we have received. Christ is what we are rooted. Christ is what we are built up. Christ is what we established in, in our faith. My right? Lord. And so Christ not only becomes that which saves us, Christ also becomes that which we're being transformed into. Woo. So this is when Rev was talking about on Sunday, when folks should come to the church, the church shouldn't be the last place where they think about being loved. My Lord. Because if we're going to be transforming into who Christ is, that means that we're going to have to do love that sometimes makes us hurt more than it hurts the people who need the love. Amen. Amen. And not only that love, it even hurts more when we have to love from the place of obedience. <laughs> yeah. That means that you're going to have to do some stuff for folks when you be like, Lord. <laughs> Lord of Jesus. Hmm. And know? sometimes you ain't going to want to do it neither. Some, Jesus said, is there any other way for this for us to do yeah. this cup. Can this cup right. pass from me, Lord? <laughs> Any other way? You remember Joe? Uh, what was it, uh, Jonah? Oh yeah, Jonah didn't want to go. My Jonah Lord, ran in the opposite did. direction and caused he, a headache he, for everybody until he went to do what God called him to do. And still, even after he did what God called him to do, he wasn't happy. <laughs> he was upset. This is church for for you. He was upset that God was forgiven for other people. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go because I knew if they repented, you was gonna forgive them. Yeah, <laughs> that's how we be. Yeah. Oh my lord, my lord! I ain't gonna forgive them because then if I forgive them, they gonna come in here and they gonna join the church. <laughs> they gonna be on this justy board. People gonna start liking them and treating them nice and gonna forget about me. <laughs> People, we yeah. wait. We may not act actively sort of say these things, but that's what's in our heart, and my what lord. starts to come out of our heart is demonstrated in these actions. My lord. All right. We're running on time, so let's 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 hop on to this next section. This is Colossians 6, uh, 8 through 15. See to it that no one, everybody say no one. No one. No one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to what tradition? Human tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the universe and not according to Christ. For in Christ the whole fullness of God dwells bodily. And you have come to fullness in Christ, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In Christ also, you were circumcised with the spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with Christ in baptism, you were also raised with Christ through faith in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with Christ when God forgave 
all of your trespasses, erasing the record that stood against you with his legal demands. God set this aside, nailing it to the cross. God disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made public example of them triumphing over them. All right, let's see what these questions are and see if we can get to these quickly. Um, what forces work against our abiding in Christ and how do they work? Let's look at verse 8. What does verse 8 talk about? What kind of forces? Captive. Captive forces. Captive forces that got to do with our thinking. Mm -hmm. Captive <laughs> forces that got to do with human tradition. The tra traditions, captive forces that got to do with uh -oh, spirits of the universe and not according to Christ. Hmm. So we so the the cards, folks. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, so in it, you know, we have to recognize that there are forces that do not want us to continue in Christ. Those forces are either going to be forces of deception. Oh, it won't hurt you. They're either going to be forces of tradition. We've always done it this way. Or they're going to be elemental spirits of the universe. See, it's just how it is. That's sort of fate, fate, luck. See, that's just how it is. None of these are what? According to Christ. According to Christ. So our continuing in Christ is not about our ability to stay with a hold of a philosophy. It's not about our ability to stay holding on to a tradition. It's not about our ability to be like, oh, yes, the universe has just brought this forth. Our call is to stay in Christ. Now, what? Does it matter for us to stay in Christ? What is verse 9 telling us? Because in Christ is the what? The whole fullness. What does fullness the, mean? The Holy Spirit. The dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So it says fullness of the deity of God, right? Fullness of deity. So what is the fullness of God? Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. If I say this cup is full, what am I saying? It's got everything in that it's supposed to have. Can't nothing else get in. That the entire, that this container contains every single thing that it can contain. So if I say the cup is full, that means that everything that is in or that, that the cup has reached a capacity that everything that the cup can hold is in there. And so to talk about Christ is to talk about everything that makes God who God is. So everything that makes God who God is dwells in Christ how? Fully? Bodily. So it says, verse 19, verse 9, for in Christ, the whole fullness of God, all God's love, all God's patience, all God's wisdom, all God's every attribute that we can think of, every attribute that exists about who God is, all of that dwells in Christ bodily, which is how we can say, Emmanuel, God with us. That when we encounter Jesus, we are not just encountering a piece of God. We are encountering the fullness of God manifested in bodily form. My spirit I give you, which is the Holy Spirit. My father, I do my father's will. Right? So there is no separation. Right? There is no um, immutability between the whole of who God is and what we encounter in Christ Jesus. Now, why is that important? Let's look at verse 10. And you have come to what? Fullness. Fullness where? In him. In Who Christ. is the head of all authority. 
So there is nothing that can hold a position of authority in your life greater than Christ Jesus. And so if that, that is the case, because in Christ Jesus is everything that makes God, who is the supreme authority of everything, who God is, every, all of that exists in Christ Jesus. Why would we surrender ourselves to authorities that pale in their capacity versus Jesus? Weak faith, weak mind. And the only way we can be weak is if we fail to continue and we allow ourselves to be taken captive. Yes. And none of us are above that. Yes. Distraction is easier than we dare to say. We have to prioritize. None of us are above it. We and must you have prioritize. come to a fullness, right? You've come to a fullness in him who is the head of a ruling authority. In Christ also you were circumcised. Now, circumcision has to do with what? Where did circumcision come into the scriptures? Cutting off. Right. Where did it come into the scriptures? That has to do with the what? The heart. Mm -mm. When did circumcision come in? Uh, with Abram. Uh, and what was the purpose of the circumcision? Uh, the circumcision was to be a sign. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. I heard of that. It was to be a sign of God's covenantal promise to Abram. And so when he affirms circumcision, you were circumcised not with just a natural circumcision, but with the spiritual circumcision by putting off your flesh, which is sinful, in the circumcision of who? Christ. So our continuing, what we what the, what what Paul is saying in this Colossians is that our continuing in Christ is actually enabling us to live less attached to our own flesh and more attached to the priorities, the spiritual priorities, the um, the ministerial priorities that make Christ who He is. Not only the circumcision, but when you were buried with Him in baptism. So what is baptism about? It ain't just about getting you wet. What is it about doing? Dying to one and being reborn in another. Maybe it is a dead. burial. But you don't stay in the water buried. You do what? You rise up. Right. So you are buried in baptism and also raised with Christ through faith in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So not only spiritual circumcision, not only baptism, but here's the, here's the real, this is why you ought to be thankful. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the circum uncircumcision of your flesh, meaning you had no covenantal rights, you had no covenantal promises, you had no contract, no nothing, no knowledge of God, you was living your best sinful life. God made you alive together with Christ when he forgave all your trespasses. God made you alive. Forgave all your trespasses, erased the record that did what? Made you sin free. What did the record do that God erased? All of our sins. Right here. What does that record do? Verse 14. Erase the record that stood against you. That stood against you. Your record, your sin was in the court testifying against you with all the evidence. You remember that one time when you were eight years old and you went in grandmama's room and you took uh, all the money out of her purse? And you said you didn't do it. And then you gave it to your friends so that they would like you. Just, just listing the whole record. So not only did God make you alive when he forgave your sins, but also erased all of the legal, the legal truth. I don't know who's, who's the... Uh... I, I think it's Brother Richard. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna mute you, brother Richard, because I think your phone is um, it's got static on it. 
erasing the record that stood against us with all of its legal demands. Your sin demanded a price. God set this aside and did what? Nailed it to the cross. Nailed it to the cross. God disarmed all of the authorities and rulers and made a public example of them triumphing over them because what God can do, see the law that we live under can only punish you for your sin. It cannot transform you. We see that now. They can send people to prison for how, it don't matter how many years and it's not transformative. They send people to lock up. And this is, this is how we respond is that we just give harsher punishment. But God did not leave us with punishment. Somebody ought to be so grateful. God recognized that our freedom, our liberty would not come through punishment, but it would come through intercession. That it would come through covering. That it would come through an amazing grace. That it would come through a mercy that would look beyond our faults and see our need. And that kind of the relationship that we have in Christ's salvation is a testimony against how rulers and authorities, civil, social, political, run nations and states. To get what nations want, they go to war. To get what nations and what communities want, they arrest people. They lock them up. They throw them in a jail. They write people off. They leave the poor destitute. But the witness that we have of God in Christ Jesus is that even when we were full-fledged, dead in our sin and trespasses, no mind to serve God, Christ made God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving us our sins, erasing the record, nailing it to the cross. What does this mean for the believer's relationship to Christ? Or what should it mean? Come on, y'all, we got time. It frees us to serve God. Mm -hmm. Frees us to serve God. Inspires our gratitude for God. Frees us to serve one another. Woo! frees us to be in relationship with each other where we're learning how to be less hurtful to one another. Yes. Frees us so that we can actually give care and receive care. Yes. All right. It puts Let's us in a god paid position. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this last section here real quick and then we'll be, uh, we'll be on our way. Therefore, therefore, after having heard all this, therefore, do not let Anybody do what? Condemn you. Condemn you. It matters of food, or oh, I can't believe you eating that. It matters of drink or observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come. But the substance of life, the substance of living, belongs to Christ. Do not let anybody disqualify you, insisting on self abasement and worship of angels or dwelling on visions or puffed up without any cause by human way of thinking. And do not hold fast to the head and do not holding and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows with a growth that is from God. <laughs> so the task that we have is that we have not been called to be so concerned about making sure that everybody else thinks that what we are doing fits with their notion of what it means to serve God. There you go. Our task, look at verse 19, is to recognize that we are holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by his ligament and sinews, grows with the growth that is from God. Everything comes from God. <laughs> so continuing in our faith, continuing and holding on to this is both a recognition to be thankful for what God has done for us, what God is doing for us, and what God will do for us, and allow that gratitude to help us to transition from trying to live lives where only thing matters is our food, our drink, our festivals, moons, and Sabbaths, 
Yeah. Our self abasement, how spiritual we are because we talked to angels, how many visions we had while we were sleeping, or any human way of thinking, which are all the ways that we can become puffed up in our faith. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I don't eat this because the Lord. I oh yeah. I, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't, uh, we don't celebrate Christmas because De- December 25th and when Jesus was born. And as if these things are part of our righteousness, but our righteousness comes from recognizing that Christ is the head. We are part of the body and we can only do because the head is in control. Amen. And from that is where we experience growth. Amen. And we, and we praise God for his awesomeness. And we thank him for his blessings. Yes. So this is the scripture focus. If you want to go back, let me go back to the slide. This is the scripture thing that they taught. Exalt the Lord who has established us. Yes. Right. So that's the focus of our prayer. And so one of the things that we've, um, that we for, for tomorrow, what we are inviting, and you all probably got this in your NBC News today, uh, and there may be another email that comes out tomorrow, is we are inviting us to sort of throughout the course of the day, uh, engage in these prayer themes. Now, the times is like, it's not meaning that you pray from five to eight, those whole three hours, you pray for yourself, but during that time period, lift up a prayer for yourself, right? Um, and that can be and should include some confession just about where you really are. What's about really what's going on with you? What are the real concerns of your heart that you have? And to ask God to speak to those things. Um, from eight to 11, Pray for your family. Um, the parts of your family that you love, you can give thanks. The parts of your family that you don't understand, you can ask God for wisdom. For the parts of your family that you can't stand, you can ask God's favor and patience and grace and compassion. Um, your church family, you know, however, you know, however broadly you want to think about family, during that late morning time, you're going to pray for family. Midday from 11 to, you know, sort of covering that range of lunch time, um, pray for the community, right? Your local community and whatever other communities that you may be a part of, the civil and social and, um, you know, communities that you may be a part of, um, that the work that they intend to do might be work that gives God glory. That we might not just have community uh, organizations that are just stuck in traditions or stuck in human philosophy. Uh, but that these things might actually start to bear witness to the light of God in Christ Jesus. Um, from the early afternoon, from two to five, pray for those in positions of authority, right? Spiritual authority, civil authority, political authority, uh, national authority, local authority, um, worldwide authority, right? All of these different entities. We want to pray um, that those who are in positions of power would recognize that all power belongs to who? God. And if they really think they're powerful, they're really fooling themselves because they will be held account for what the things that they do in power. So we want to pray for those who are in authority, the presidents, the rulers, the dictators, all of those things in our world. And then early evening, we want to pray for the peoples of the world. In the email that was sent out uh, today and that you're probably going to like say get tomorrow, um, there are many nations in the world that are in conflict. Um, from obviously Ukraine, but also in Yemen, in Ethiopia, in West Africa, um, there's been severe drought uh, and and famine because of that. In terms of like people not even being able to grow food and have food to eat, um, in China um, and in other portions of the world, we even know the conflicts that are still taking place along the southern border of the United States. Um, so we pray for the peoples of the world. We pray for the church in the world that's suffering from persecution. Um, right. We pray for um, you know, uh, um, the refugees who are trying to find ways home, um, still in Afghanistan and obviously in the Ukraine. Uh, and then late evening, eight o'clock until whenever you go to bed, um, give God thanks. Give God thanks. Because even while we can recognize that there are so many needs that are around in our world, there's still a whole lot to be thankful for. Uh, and we don't want to miss out on, on remembering right to give God thanks. Thanks that God even allows us to be honest about the things that weigh heavy on our hearts, uh, allows us to be honest about the questions and uh, and the things that we're dealing with and we're facing. So we just invite you in the course of the day tomorrow, as you remember, 
um, to just lift up those things, even if you don't do it in this order. This is just kind of to kind of give people a sense of of, of of a range of things to pray for. But let's tomorrow join in with the church globally uh, and nationally uh, that will be praying and interceding for God's wisdom and God's um, God's hand of, of justice uh, to make itself known in our world. Um, amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, we are way over our time. I'm going to blame Reverend Bobby if Pastor says something to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to let Reverend Bobby take the fall. Um, but thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Reverend Bobby, um, You know for the wisdom that you share with us um, as well on tonight. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, let us close in a word of prayer. Reverend Bobby, will you close us in prayer? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, God Almighty, you brought us here this evening, Lord, to hear a word from you, a word that will carry us through to be better servants in your kingdom. Help us to study your word and be obedient to your will. These prayers we ask in Jesus' name. And all that love the Lord say, amen. 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 God bless amen. each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good word, brother. Good, Good luck.